welcome to the Publishers Panel German Literature and Translation as part of the Advanced German Literature, Literature Translation Workshop run by the British Centre for Literary Translation and supported by the National Centre for Writing, the Goethe Institute and New Books in German. My name is Rebecca DeWald and I am a bilingual translator, mainly working with German and English, but also French and very occasionally with Spanish as well. I also work at the National Centre for Writing, where I coordinate the Emerging Translator Mentorships Programme. To give you a little description of what I look like, um, I'm a woman in my mid-30s. I'm white. I've got a short, curly brown bob, which is always messier than I'd like it to be. Um, I'm wearing red lipstick and a leopard print um, blouse. I'm going for a sort of 50s glam look today. Um, I'm in my office, which has got piles of books behind me, which are threatening to topple over me. So fingers crossed that's not going to happen during this event. Before we begin, just a tiny bit of housekeeping as well. Um, if you'd like captions enabled for the session, you find at the bottom of the screen a button that says live transcript, which you can click on and you'll find subtitles um, coming out for the whole session. The session will run for one hour. Um, the first part will be a discussion between me and the panelists, which will last for about 40 to 45 minutes. We will then have a tiny break of about two minutes where we'll turn our, um, leave our cameras on, but turn our sounds off to give you a couple of minutes to gather your thoughts um, and think about questions for the Q&A. You can also obviously think about them during the session as well, but it might help you reflect on what you've heard. The Q&A will be about 10 to 15 minutes as well. And if you've got questions for our panelists, um, please use the Q&A box, which is also the bottom of your screens to post your questions in there. Please do not use the chat box for that. Um, other participants, other audience members also have the option to upvote some of the questions. So instead of multiplying the same question um, various times, it might be good to, to turn that on. Um, now that you've got used to my voice, hopefully, um, it's time to hear some other voices. And I'd like to introduce you to our publishers, because I'm delighted to welcome three publishers today, each of whom have made a name for themselves publishing outstanding literary fiction and nonfiction, including in particular German language titles in English translation. I will introduce you um, to them one by one. First, on, first up, we've got Molly Slide. Molly, if you'd like to turn your camera on. Molly is the publisher at Scribe Publications UK, the London branch of the award-winning international independent publishing house, where she commissions and edits literary, literary fiction and narrative nonfiction, as well as managing the team. She is a bookseller rising star, an LBF, an LBF trailblazer, and a Claw Emerging Leaders Fellow. Molly, would you like to say hello and give a um, description of yourself, please? Yes, thank you. Um, so, hi, I'm Molly. I am a woman, a white woman in my early 30s. I have long brown hair. I'm wearing glasses and I am sitting in my sitting room in East London, which is painted dark blue. Thanks so much, Molly. Next up, we've got Aina Marti. Aina, if you want to turn your camera on. Um, Aina is the founder of New Eloise Press, a publishing house specializing in literary fiction written by women and where women are at the center of the stories. Eloise Press' first release, Thirsty Sea by Erika Mu and translated by Clarissa Botsford, was released in May and has been followed by three more titles this year, among them a German Swiss book, What Concerns Us by Laura Vogt, translated by Caroline White. Before that, Aina worked as a lecturer and in TV production. Aina, would you also like to describe yourself and tell us about what were you? Hello, uh, thank you for inviting me here. So my physical description is uh, brown long hair, straight hair, but it's fake straight. Um, and I'm in a room, I'm in my house, I'm in the studio full of maps that that's my partner's making really. And I wear a kind of blues with, uh, so blue with some white cats. Perfect. Thank you very much, Aina. And finally, we've got Bishan Samada. Um, Bishan, also, if you'd like to turn your camera on. Bishan is an editor and one of the directors of Seagull Books. Based in Kolkata, Seagull has been championing fiction, nonfiction, and plays in translation for 40 years. And the language-specific lists are a go-to for anyone wanting to read up on the literature of a specific linguistic context. Bishan also commissions for Seagull's Pride list, which showcases LGBTQ plus literature. Hi, Bishan. Would you also say quick hellos and describe what you look like and where you are? Sure. Hi, I hope you can hear me. Uh, uh, I'm joining you all from Calcutta, India. 
Uh, it's a little late in the evening, so I'm at my home. Uh, you can see uh, some books behind me, and there are actually many more in the room, uh, which you can't see right now. I'm just uh, an Indian man. Uh, uh, I have black hair and black beard. And uh, through uh, the panel, I might sometimes wear glasses, sometimes not. <laughs> and I'm wearing a simple blue T-shirt because I'm, I'm just at home, so I didn't uh, <laughs> bother to dress up too much. I hope that's okay. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing my experience and also about uh, um, also to hearing everybody else's uh, experience in publishing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, it's absolutely not a um, dress shirt event. Um, we're very much um, <laughs> accepting of that, of course. Um, I thought it might be quite helpful if we start by learning more about each of your publishing houses, each of your lists specifically, and obviously with the German focus. Um, so questions I've got to um, narrow this down a bit is just a bit like, what do you specialize in? Where do translations come in your list in general? Because I don't think you just specifically focus on translations. So obviously where, where do translations sit alongside your other publishing? Um, and then if you maybe want to pick out a German project, German language project, past, present or future that you'd like to highlight, which might be easier for some than for others. Um, she was going that order again, Molly, would you like to start? Sure, yeah. So um, a bit of background on Scribe. We're originally an Australian company um, and we were founded just over 45 years ago by a guy called Henry Rosenblum, who's still our owner and founder and still very active in our publishing. Um, and Scribe UK, the office that I run, was set up. Um, we're actually going to be celebrating our 10th birthday next year, which is really exciting. Um, and it was sort of set up because of the way that book rights work. Um, so rights um, for publishing books tend to be grouped into regions and UK and Commonwealth is one of the regions. And of course, that includes Australia. And so what we were finding in the Australian office was that it was getting harder to buy just Australian rights for a book because UK publishers wanted to include them in their deals. But if we did buy UK and Commonwealth, we weren't able to exploit that in the UK because we didn't have a UK office. So Henry um, decided to set up the UK office 10 years ago. Um, we've been publishing in the UK ever since. Um, we also now have a US publishing operation too. So we're now a global independent English language publisher. And um, in the UK, we're a team of seven we're, and we're part of the Independent Alliance, which is a group of the kind of top independent publishers um, who will share a sales force. And that includes other publishers like Faber and Faber, Granta, Canongate, um, lots of great publishers. And in the UK, we publish about 60 books a year. Um, this is slightly less than we do in Australia, um, just because some of the books that we do out there don't work here and vice versa. But mostly we publish the same list. And then our US list is quite a lot smaller. It's about 20 to 30 books a year. And that's just to do with what rights we have. Um, so on the UK list, maybe a third of the books are in translation, which is fairly high for a British publisher. And it's something that I know that the UK staff and the Australian staff and the US staff are all really um, passionate about bringing kind of books into the English language that haven't been brought before. Um, so it's something we're very dedicated to and sort of, I, I think, known for. Um, and the list itself is a mix of literary fiction. We don't do any genre fiction at all. It's all literary, but it's quite broad within that. Uh, we also publish nonfiction from like very commercial books through to kind of traditional serious nonfiction and then through to kind of um, literary narrative nonfiction. And we have a picture books imprint called Scribble. So it keeps us very busy. We publish a lot of books. And um, our two best selling titles in fiction and nonfiction are both German books of all our list, like including all the English language titles. So our best selling Non-fiction title of all time is a book called Gut by Julia Enders. Uh, that's translated by David Shaw. And that was like a very unexpected, massive bestseller for us and sold, you know, hundreds of thousands of copies. And it basically has paid all our salaries for years, which is great. <laughs> and then our best-selling fiction title ever is a book called The Eighth Life by Nina Haratishvili. And that was translated by Charlotte Collins and Ruth Martin. And I worked on that book so I can kind of speak a bit 
about that later. Um, but we published that globally in the English language and we've sold about 40,000 copies now of all our editions. Uh, which is great, but it's kind of a drop in the ocean because across all languages, that book's now sold over a million, which is incredible. Wow. Um, I think we can maybe come to like the sort of risk taking aspect of it a bit later as well, because it's interesting because gut is what it says on the tin, isn't it? It's a book about the gut. Yeah. Which is probably an unlikely bestseller. In the eighth life, um, I think one of his remarkable features is also, apart from being a brilliant book, that it's a thousand pages long is that right it's just under a thousand pages long yeah hence having two translators working on it um but yeah we we can get to that later yeah so so neither you're like classic um books that translators and publishers should acquire in translation because they're they're not your risk-free book acquisition so it's really fascinating that they also happen to be bestsellers as well so also hopeful in that sense um um, Aina do you want to also say a bit about your publishing house and how um you probably had the slightly different end to scribe in the sense that you don't publish 60 books a year I would imagine 50 or 60 books. Um, yes Rebecca let me first correct I just realized I describe myself terribly so there's an import I'm just not used to that so <laughs> I'm from Spain so you might notice an accent and that's why and I in my mid thirties and white I think I forgot that everybody else said uh <laughs> these details so um yeah, so, well, it's Eloise Press, it's baby Eloise, really, I call it, um, the first, so I registered the company in July 21, and the first book came out last May, and there are three books, as you said, um, these three more books coming this year, and yeah, so it's, uh, the idea was to have a home for women's writing only, but also that the story was centered and focused on some kind of women's experiences across mm-hmm. the world. Um, this year, they are all translations, but that's not um, the essence of the house. So next year, for example, uh, we'll have a title from Canada. Um, the point is that because it's about women across the world, so women's lives, um, it will just need to have more translations because there are more languages in the world, it's English. <laughs> so, it is, I mean, you see, I mean, there's more countries that don't speak English than the ones uh, that do. So, naturally, that, that will be the case. Um, what else can I say? I think, I mean, of course, I don't have these incredible figures that Molly just share, but funny enough, I can tell that the book that has sold the most so far is the book that is still. Uh, not out, which is the one uh, for later this month, uh, Nino Burawi, Satisfaction, where the pre-orders are being quite impressive. And I can say that it has sold more than the other titles that are already out yeah. so far. So we'll see um, how it goes. That, yeah, I don't know if I should say anything else or any um, other questions. If you want to talk about the Swiss German title um, specifically and what kind of book that is, for example. So uh, this is the book which concerns us yeah. uh, by Laura Vogt, uh, translated by Caroline Wade. She's uh, Swiss, the author. And this is a book about uh, new motherhood. And but also uh, there is this natural depression and there is a lot of contradictions in the characters where is I think is a book where everybody thinks something about themselves and they are wrong about themselves. So that's uh, something that Laura explores very nicely. Um, yeah, so that's the main topic. That's why I chose this title. I found it really fascinating how the characters' contradictions play out, etc. Excellent. Thanks so much for that. Um, Bishan, would you like to give an introduction to Seagull? Um, and I think you're not going to like me asking the question of, can you choose Bonnie for favourite German titles on your list? Because you've got quite a few of them, haven't you? Yes, that's very true. OK, I'll begin with a little bit about Seagull. Uh, actually, we have been publishing for 40 years now. This is our 40th year. We completed 40 years. But for... Uh, the first 25 years we were publishing only in India. And at that time we were publishing a lot of books in translation, but from Indian languages into English. Uh, In 2007, our uh, 
founder Naveen Kishore decided to set up a branch, a company in London, uh, which became Seagull Works London Limited. Uh, that helped us secure international distribution for our books. And that really changed the way we function. Uh, we never moved to London, honestly. We hardly ever hired anybody, uh, any editorial staff in London. All the editorial work still happens in Kolkata in India. Uh, but uh, our books are distributed internationally by the University of Chicago Press and in, in the UK by Yale University Press. It's a good match. Uh, we are an independent publisher. We do uh, fairly serious literary uh, uh, fiction and uh, in terms of nonfiction, we do serious philosophy, uh, culture studies, uh, performance studies, drama as well some cinema maybe. So it's a fairly serious sounding uh, reading uh, list of books. So it's a good match. We found a good match with the university press. They kind of understand the kind of books we do mm. and they're able to represent uh, us better. Uh, so for the last 15 years, we've been publishing a lot of books uh, in translation from European languages and German being pretty much uh, perhaps the most widely uh, uh, the language from which we have translated most. Uh, and uh, in terms of an Im important project, I, I, it's very difficult for me to pinpoint a particular title, uh, but I'll talk about a little bit about a particular series that we uh, recently sort of completed, so to speak. And I had the distinction of actually uh, overseeing the entire process of this publication. Uh, so we generally, Seagull generally publishes uh, its first edition in hardback, uh, in, 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 in cloth, uh, which is obviously uh, uh, the general uh, tradition in publishing. And we've, over the last 15 years, we've published so many books from, from trusted from the German, uh, not just from Germany, but also obviously from Switzerland, from Austria. Uh, uh, yeah, Switzerland and Austria primarily uh, in terms of uh, other countries, other German speaking countries. And we decided to bring out 100 titles in a series, in a paperback series. Uh, so 100 books translated into English from the German language. And these are books uh, by a very well-known important German authors from the 20th century, uh, as well as uh, by very contemporary young, you know, Swiss German authors. So there's a very wide range of books from, uh, they, they, they vary from like uh, 60 pages to 1000 pages uh, in length. And uh, they, they have a serious look, which uh, the, the, the covers use the colors of the German flag, actually, but uh, you can't really recognize that. You have to like think well, what these colors are. Uh, so that we are very proud of. Uh, at this point, I must say that uh, the project was generously supported by the Goethe Institute uh, and without whose help, we would probably not be able to uh, do uh, such a big project. Uh, thousands and thousands of copies of 100 titles <laughs> printed and sent out into the world. So that's uh, quite something. So we are very excited about uh, that particular project. In terms of what we have seen um, get more attention, in general, are works that we have published by one or two already fairly well-known authors who have, through the 20th century, been uh, already translated into English and published. Uh, people like Thomas Bernard, uh, mm -hmm. people like Christa Wolf. Uh, these, we, we, we've seen that when we bring out books, new books uh, by these authors, there's always a lot of interest and they sell good and they uh, get a lot of like critical attention as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for that question. Um, I should also say for the awareness of doubt, when we say German, we do generally talk about German language. So not just, um, yeah, I, I hope that was clear um, in terms of German, Swiss, German, Austrian. Um, yeah, 
just I also use German as a shorthand for for the language rather than the country. Um, Bishan, you already um, touched on sort of receiving funding as well to support with this mammoth project of 100 books. Um, I was wondering how you each find out about German language titles specifically. I mean, in that case, how do you select 100, which is a lot, but it's still there's thousands, millions of books. Um, how do you, how do each of you pick your German language title specifically, um, and does funding kind of play a role in that with, as well, or is it also do they come to you through um, through agents? Do they come to you for um, through connections with other publishers? Do you accept pitches, or is that something that like you know maybe sometimes, but there's not a route? Like, what's your vision? Do you want to continue on that? Yeah, sure. Uh... An interesting thing about us or everybody, we are a very small team at Seagull. But the interesting thing is that none of us really speaks German. <laughs> so it's so we can't really pick up a book and read it and decide to do it in English. Mm -hmm. That's a bit of a handicap, but at the same time, it saves us a lot of time uh, because we believe in trusted friends. <laughs> uh, the way it began uh, is... Uh, we, we began by uh, publishing authors who had already been published in English and whose work we had already read in English. Yes. As I said, like, you know, people like Thomas Bernard or Christoph Wolf or Hans Magdusen Zinsberger, Alexander Kluka. Uh, and then uh, with the one, with the authors uh, who are alive, uh, some of the names I just said, uh, you know, they've passed away a long time back. Uh, we became uh, good friends with them uh, as publishers and uh, the list started growing through recommendations of uh, other German authors who believed in our work and we believed in their taste. Uh, and then of course, after a few books, uh, we, we, we also uh, realized that translators whom, with whom we had worked could also be uh, roped in to make suggestions. Uh, so we asked them uh, specifically what kind of books you would like to do and why. So they would make pitches and based on that we would, uh, and, and you know, give us samples and based on that we would pick, pick books up. And that's actually how it's grown. Mm -hmm. uh, we have very good relations with the major publishing houses in uh, Germany. Uh, yeah, from Zurkam. I mean, oh, with, with, with Zurkam Verlag, which is perhaps the biggest German publisher of literary mm -hmm. uh, works. Uh, with, just with them, we, we, we published, I think, like 70, 80 books. Uh, so this, yeah. and uh, we, we get suggestions from their rights managers as well, uh, because they know what kind of books we do, what matches. We try to publish works by the same author uh, even sometimes when we just believe in the work uh, and we don't really look at how many copies it has sold or how, uh, you know, how many reviews it's got. But if one of us editors really likes the work, we would pick up the next book, at least, uh, at least the next book, and then we'll see, like, you know, what happens. So it, it's, it's grown like that. But as you say, uh, there's uh, so much out there and, uh, we still have to say no to so many, so many books because, you know, we are a small team and this is as much as we can do. We do accept some uh, uh, pitches, but uh, currently uh, we are a little full up. So uh, although we are continuing to commission uh, more German language books, uh, but we are not that actively seeking uh, pitches, uh, mm -hmm. But uh, m more like recommendations from uh, our uh, German friends or our author friends or translator friends. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I'm sure like uh, w once we're out of this backlog, we will be able to look more actively for new, new, new titles from, from everybody. Okay. I'm just imagining the, the people you asked to help building that list that feels like you know kid in the candy store when you're like which German books would you want to feature on this list and which ones do you want to translate and I'm just picturing all these German translators and, and German literary people thinking ah which ones to choose and but what a great task as well it's nice to see that people lots of people were involved in in building that list as well and um, Molly on that question as well 
would you how how do you find German language titles? We just kind of you talked about the the two best selling ones as well, um, and I think amongst translators is quite well known that really long books are really difficult to usually find publishers for who would like take on these kind of translation tasks. So um, how how did that specifically come about with that one with um, the Night Eighth Life, for example, um, and how generally do you find German literature um, to translate? Um, so we we find. German and other language literature by all sorts of means. So um, one of the kind of challenges of working in the English language and in translation and not sort of limiting where your translations are coming from is that um, almost any publisher in the world could pitch me a book and they do. Uh, <laughs> so I get literally hundreds and hundreds of submissions a year and there's no way I can look at all of them. Um, so submissions from... German publishers, German agents, um, and international agents who represent German authors. That's that's a big one. And also just looking at catalogues and going to book fairs and meeting people. And you kind of get to know people um, who you've maybe met before at the fair or you've bought a book from or you've done you met on a fellowship or whatever, and you, you kind of develop those relationships. And so you then their submissions like rise up in your inbox a bit. Um, Scribe also has a German scout because we do publish quite a lot of German books. So we have um, somebody on the ground in Germany who's scouting the market for us and kind of trying to find interesting titles that aren't necessarily the ones that are publishers' priorities to pitch to, but might be kind of interesting anyway. Um, and yeah, translators. So with Gut, it was pitched to Henry, our owner at Frankfurt by the publisher. And he bought it sight unseen. Like he just really liked the pitch. It was kind of before all of the big books about gut health came out. So it was sort of right at the cusp of that. And Scribe had always done um, kind of expert led um, popular health, popular science. And I think it just really appealed to him on that basis. And it was already selling quite well in Germany. And we all thought he was a bit mad. Like we went, oh, you've bought a book about the gut. Okay. And then of course he was completely right, which is why he's the publisher and the owner. And, you know, we all bow down to him, but it sold enormous numbers of copies and we were all delighted. And with The Eighth Life, um, one of the translators, Charlotte Collins, came to uh, my colleague Philip at the book fair and kind of cold approached him. I think I, I don't, but she, I think she's here. So she might correct me in the comments, but I don't believe she knew him that well beforehand or maybe hadn't even met him and just told him about this book that sounded kind of too good not to publish. And I remember he came back from Frankfurt and he came into the office and he sort of slammed this thing down on my desk and it was um, like a little leaflet about the book. And, um, it was such a good pitch. Like it was just so immediately so appealing about this kind of chocolate making dynasty in Georgia and how, you know, the Soviet Union had changed over the last hundred years and this family with all these really involving characters. And then, you know, it was a thousand pages and we went, oh no, because that is just an enormous translation cost it's an enormous amount of resource going behind it editorially it takes a lot of time and the printing cost is huge the shipping cost is huge like there's nothing easy about a thousand page book and he said um don't you think this sounds great you'll be able to get a grant for it right? and I went uh yeah probably um and luckily we did we've got we got grants from the Goethe Institute and from English Pen to support um our translation which covered about half of the total translation cost. So it was still a book that we really um, had invested a lot into by the time it was published. So thank goodness it was such a success. But I, I would say, please don't pitch me all your thousand page books um, <laughs> because I will, uh, it, that's something you can do once in a blue moon. And actually I, I love a novella really. Um, <laughs> but I do, I, I think that illustrates why it's good to take pictures from translators actually, because I think that um, I don't I this was sort of the eighth life was taking off in Germany and it had started selling quite well. And I think it had been sold into the Netherlands at this point, but it hadn't kind of become a huge bestseller there yet. It wasn't out yet. So it wasn't kind of necessarily the most obvious book to position for translation. And I don't know if the publisher would have put it forward because it's so long. Mm. 
But, you know, we had this great translator who was so passionate about it and could tell us exactly why it was brilliant and it was very convincing. And I think talking to translators, that's where you can find the kind of hidden gems. Mm. And those are the books that everyone wants, really, because, you know, this the stuff that is top of um, the agents' lists and that they're going to be pitching to everyone, like if, if it's good enough and if it's the right fit for the market, someone will publish it. Mm. So you know, as an indie publisher and trying to be kind of clever about the way that we publish and, and interesting about what we bring into the English language. I do think that that translator insight is really special. And the other sort of means, which is slightly informal by which we find books to translate, is just like chatting to our friends who are publishers in other countries. So you do all these fellowships and you meet all these editors in different countries and at the book fair you know all you talk about is like what have you heard about and what are you publishing and you know they don't have an agenda which is quite nice they don't they're not trying to sell it to you and they don't want to translate it for you they're just saying oh there's this really interesting German book have you heard about it and so you kind of get that word of mouth as well um through those networks but I for me the most challenging part of being a publisher and an editor is managing submissions because mm. you know I I maybe commission 10 to 15 new books a year which means I edit 10 to 15 books a year as well as running the company mm. and so finding the time to read and respond to submissions outside of that is challenging and so I do I, I always slightly hesitate to say pitch me directly because although you can um, my email inbox is a terrible place and so I may not respond in a timely manner um, because it may just sink down. And I think also, you know, this is why if you have a personal relationship with the publisher, if you've translated for them before, they know you're really great and they trust you, that again will just rise up in your inbox and you'll go, oh yeah, well, I worked with this translator on this book and that was great. So, you know, I'm going to trust them um, again this time. Um, so yeah, I'd say, I think it's a good idea to pitch to publishers, but I think be very selective. And I have had... Um, Pretty slightly less experienced translators in the past contact me and say, I have these five books I want to translate. And that that tends to sort of not get, I don't tend to look at those emails as, as carefully because I just think like if I'm commissioning 10 to 15 new titles a year, mm-hmm. one, maybe two of those will be German. Not all of them. Like I, I want to publish a diverse and varied list. And that part of that is linguistic diversity. And so, you know, there are so many hundreds of, brilliant German books out there that absolutely deserve to be published in English but I can't do them all and so please pick your favorite if you're going to pitch <laughs> and please know know the publishers list and know I get people who send me like oh this is crime but it's like literary intelligent crime and I'm like I don't publish crime they're like but it's intelligent crime and I'm like I still don't publish crime mm-hmm. you know so just kind of be as as appealing as possible as a pitch and be as kind of relevant and succinct as possible and that's the best way to get your pitch actually looked at by a publisher it's really helpful thanks so much for explaining that in detail as well because it's really helpful to know what both of your day-to-day lives look like in terms of just the vast amounts of information that you get like flooded with effectively of like a submission you already had like a recommendation in the chat as well of, like you should publish this person you should publish this person which probably happens to to all of you um regularly to just I was just picturing as you were talking Molly, Molly I was picturing how um it, it sounds a bit like you know when when you go to a secondhand bookshop and you're just hoping for this one treasure to find in this bookshop that has piles and piles of books everywhere and it could be could be any of those books and it just kind of there's a bit of luck involved in finding the right book that like yeah, fits that's what exactly you're, the experience yeah. um except that it's sort of it's emails and it's people ringing you and it's people saying you haven't responded to my email and you feeling terribly guilty about that but also just never being able to respond to every email it's just not possible exactly and I saw that Charlotte Collins is here and responded in the chat saying she had a chat with the um, editor the year before about Nino Harach really so it's also it also shows that like it's a long game as well don't expect to like meet somebody meet a publisher at the book fair suggest a book and it's gonna you know, be this best-selling translation. Yeah, actually and actually really- on that, I would say book fairs are like the worst time to meet publishers because, <laughs> you know, for a publisher, the book fair is basically a series of back-to-back 30-minute meetings. Mm-hmm. And when you look at your schedule over the three or four days, like it is like start at nine, you do back-to-back half-hour meetings till five and then you go to his parties and stuff. And I think um, 
it's a mistake actually to go up to publishers during the book fair because they are most likely snatching 20 seconds in between being kind of pitched at and they've got pitch fatigue. So although Charlotte was successful that time, I think it's it, it's better to make an approach at an event or, you know, if, they, if they're doing like a translation panel at a book fair or something like that, then it's fine. But I think if people are just kind of going in and out of meetings, it can be a bit like, you know, you're just, you've got that one minute to have a quick break and go to the loo and then someone starts telling you about a book and you just think, I've heard about so many books today, please stop. <laughs> so it's not necessarily the best time to do a cold pitch. Um, I think there are other kind of more appropriate times to do that. Although, as I say, I did work on this occasion, so what do I know? So it is a, it is a bit of luck involved and a bit of being at the right place at the right time. Um, Aina, I saw on your website, though, that you do you are open to submissions and suggestions. Are you now regretting that? <laughs> you know, Not at all. I think. Or, or how, yeah. How do you uh, find out about books um, that you then choose to publish? Uh, well, what concerns us, I found it in new books in German, which I might take this opportunity to say I love new books in German. <laughs> Is I always find the selection they have, how they create, Uh, do you go to a point it's you know it doesn't take much time for you to go through it especially if you already have a pre-selection of it's going to be only women and certain topics um so Laura worked I found her there on their website um and then pictures from translators mainly I think for German literature so far these two so new books in German and translators have been the best source um so I still, I'm still able to manage my inbox <laughs> quite well. So I might take time to answer, but I know I'll get there eventually. And I really like to look at the suggestions. Translators, I think they are really good. They love what they propose. And I don't know, it has worked quite well. I do reject many of them, but uh, I, I do have something, a good vibes about translators and their pitches. Um, so that's what I would do. I agree, Molly mentioned the uh, book fairs. My first book fair was London this year. I found it extremely exhausting. <laughs> and I also found it, I suppose it also depends on your personality. I work very well in the email. Um, so I found, for example, in London, that a lot of people I met, we were already in touch. I already had their list. So it didn't contribute much. It didn't bring me anything new um so if someone sends me an email for sure I will eventually read it and read the sample um yes so that's that's how I go through it and then that's once... like the opposite for me um yeah. I'm like because because I have email fatigue I'm much more likely to respond to something in person I was actually just typing an answer to a a question in the Q&A about book fairs and how important they are mm -hmm. and whether like we'll continue to see them in person and I, I think having hybrid models is good but ultimately going to Frankfurt this year has just reminded me how incredibly important in-person contact is and you know I find that when you actually sit down with people you can kind of get to the heart of okay you've got 10 books you want to pitch me but which one do you like really want to pitch me and you can also very quickly head off anything that doesn't sound right for you rather than having to kind of type out a whole email about it and and just for me is a much kind of more organic way of having those discussions so I'm very pro in-person meetings and book fairs and stuff I just find it personally easier but then I'm clearly not on top of my email as much as you <laughs> I just saw you nodding are you pro pro anti-book fair <laughs> I'm, um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm somewhere midway. <laughs> <laughs> my colleagues, but my colleagues are very, very fond of, uh, uh, Frankfurt. Uh, I, uh, don't always go to the Frankfurt book fair. <clears throat> my boss always does. Uh, the last two years it did not happen. So this time they went back after uh, three years, uh, And it was hugely rewarding, as Molly was saying, because uh, it's not that our business stopped in the last two years because we were emailing, we knew what was being published. We were being pitched uh, books online. 
We were picking them up. We were doing contracts. So that didn't stop. Uh, but there is definitely something, not just about, uh, not, not just about the pitching bit, or not just about like buying rights. Mm-hmm. Just at a human level to have uh, the relationship uh, with, with 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 everyone with with authors who visit, with translators who visit, with the rights agents, with the publishers that we meet, because we also try to sell our some of our books that originate with us in the English language into languages, uh, uh, into European languages. Mm-hmm. So uh, that kind of thing uh, is important in publishing because for a lot of us editors, especially, we spend so much time staring at screens. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of our authors, I mean, you know, I live in Calcutta, like none of my authors, <laughs> you know, live here or even visit half the time. So, you know, I don't even get to meet them ever. Uh, so it's important to be able to, I think, uh, just connect at a human level with uh, people. So that that's where uh, the book fair is so important. But uh, with, with in, in, in today's world with, with, with email and WhatsApp, the business carries on, but that's, that's more like a follow-up. Like, you know, these are the books I saw. Okay, that looked really interesting. Fine, I'll, I'll, I'll go back, I'll follow up on that. But that half an hour of meeting uh, still makes a lot of difference. Mm, that's good to know, yeah. Yeah, and I'm, yeah, I totally understand that with your, yeah, if you don't usually meet lots of people, not usually meet lots of your authors as well, it's obviously like a different a change of scenery and stuff as well. I think lots of translators appreciate that as well, going to the book fair and action meeting. They usually huddle at the Literary Translation Centre, to be fair, because that's where everybody's hiding from all the, all the thing around it. Um, I did want to ask you about how you work with translators as well, and also it made me think at the moment as well, um, in terms of what what other work is involved, so how do you how do you work with translators? What makes a good translator? And I put that in inverted commas because it's such a subjective question. Um, in terms of working with them on a text, but also on the other things that come um with it. So, for example, book promotion and all that kind of stuff as well. And I'm also asking that knowing that for a few translators or quite a few translators, that is out with their comfort zone, like the you know, we often feel quite comfortable with the text and the book and kind of working working with the language and then being asked to kind of, you know, be on stage and, and kind of represent a book as well. How much do you work with a translator on that side of things as well? So, yeah, so two-part question in terms of what, what makes a good translator in terms of your working relationship with them and what, what other things do you expect of them? Um, Aina, should we start with you? So, so far, I found that translators love being involved in the promotion side of things. So it's been a really good experience with all of them. Even actually, Caroline was when we had the book events. She was in Lithuania, I think, mm-hmm. and she joined on Zoom. So we had some technical issues where it was quite fun. So she was the so there was the author, the host, and Caroline's face on the laptop and it worked out quite well um they so what i just i asked them would you like to have this interview with this journalist or be in that event and they so far always say yes um they are very happy to do that i have some really beautiful beautiful experience with the first book for example erica and her translator clarissa now i think they are so good friends. Um, Clarissa is actually she that she lives in Italy and she does like wedding secular ceremonies and she married, uh, she celebrated the marriage of Erica and her boyfriend last month. So it was they are really close and it's just so lovely. Um, so they go together everywhere. So it's like a pair. So if I schedule an event, I know it's both of them um so yeah that's that's very good if they if someday I find a translator that doesn't like this that's totally fine it actually will be cheaper for me in terms of working (laughs) everything um and then I think the well a good translator of course needs to write very good English and be excellent in terms of the work but also at a personal level um for me well I don't have can't think of any examples, but I think someone who 
it's quite autonomous and independent. Um, so usually at the beginning when you put in touch the author and the translator and they do their thing. Um, unless the translator has some questions that usually come more at the end and then we team up together to see how to complete the text, etc. Um, so this autonomy and also um, kind of easiness. So for example, Caroline was fantastic in the sense that she was very relaxed, very like, uh, yeah, I've been Zoom and Divan, great. Um, it's anything. It was non-stress at all. Um, so that was that was really good. Uh, also, reliability, I think. Um, so they need to submit. Well, they need to. It's good if they submit in time or if they communicate. I think communication for me is really important as well. So you know, everybody knows what's going on, and yeah, that makes things easier. Excellent. Um, Molly, do you want to say something about the um, working relationship with the translators? Yeah, so um, I don't speak any languages other than English. And so I really rely on the translators that I work with um, to do their jobs really well, which they do. So that's good. Um, but I was talking to Nikki Smalley, who's a translator from um, Missy Swedish the other day, who I, who's a friend, but also who I've worked with before, about what makes a great translation and I think um, it's really interesting because we both kind of reached the same conclusion which is that what we want a translation to do is to channel the spirit of the original book and I, I do think um, there are kind of different schools of thought within translating and, and not none, nothing's particularly wrong or right but for me I get a bit prickly when I hear people say oh and you don't even know it's a translation I just mm -hmm. think what's the point of translating it then you know <laughs> and I know that's supposed to be a compliment and it's supposed to be you know it's, it reads really well and really smoothly but I think you can have a book that reads really well and is still like clearly a translation because the whole point of translating books is bringing books that are doing something different to what's being done in the English language um, to these readers and so for me the goal isn't to kind of smooth over, um, but nor is it to be too literal. And I think that that happens too, where you kind of, you read a translation and the sentence construction is really hard to wrap your head around as an English reader because they've just copied the original. This happens particularly in um, the Nordic languages. I've noticed mm -hmm. that the sentence construction seems quite different. And that is, also not great because if your reader doesn't know in what's going on then that's not good too so I feel like for me what I want the translator to do is really interrogate what the original text is doing and talk to the author about their intentions and you know is this sentence supposed to be overlong and kind of tricky and leading you down the garden path a bit in which case let's not simplify it in English because you're losing that effect mm. I think it's really important to kind of understand what the author is trying to do with language in the original and then find an English equivalent to do that in the translation. Um, but there's, as I said, there's a lot of trust involved. And what we do tend to do is when we're trying to find a translator for a project, sometimes a project will come with a translator. You know, someone's pitched it to you and there's already a great sample and you think, yeah, this is great. Um, but sometimes you'll be in a situation where you, you need to choose a translator. And what we've just done this actually for a book at Scribe, we're in the process of doing it. And what we've done is we've asked uh, three interested translators to submit the same sample translation for which they're being paid. Um, and then we blind compare those. Um, and it's based on the same rates. So it's nothing to do with like the rate of pay or when they can get it done. That's all sorted out before they submit the samples. They blind submit them. And then myself and our other editors, and actually in this case, the author too, because they speak very good English, are assessing them between us. And we have arguments about which one we like best and why. <laughs> and I think from that, you can kind of glean whether because you're comparing multiple samples, you can sort of glean whether a translator has slightly imposed like Americanisms or Britishisms or their own style onto something. Um, but a lot of it is just about instinct. And then the other things I would say in terms of working with the translator and how 
you can kind of make that process smooth. I I like translators who are very communicative. Like if you're running late, just tell me. Like don't don't keep it a secret until the day you're mm-hmm. supposed to deliver. Um, you know, and it's usually fine. And I think translators. Um, I mean, mo- most of the translators I work with are such pros, honestly, especially compared to authors. <laughs> I love authors, but like translators will leave you lovely little comments in the margins about how they transliterated a certain word and their exact like methodology. And, you know, they'll say, oh, and I found the origin of this really obscure quote and don't worry, like you don't need to get permission for it. And I just love the translators who understand that this is a, a profession and like, the more they can give you as an editor, the better. And, you know, they'll leave a little comment saying, it's not my place to edit this, but I think pro- probably you should. And like, here's my suggestion. And I'd like nine times out of 10, I'm like, yes, they're exactly right. And I just, um, I just edited a translated book in German actually. Um, and I just barely had to do anything because the translator, uh, Ruth Martin, who I think might be here, <laughs> is just such a pro. And I was like, this is, you know, this is a total joy. Like I'm barely <laughs> doing any line editing at all because she'd already kind of thought through all the things an editor would normally think through. Um, so yeah, I, I love working with translators. They're brilliant. And um, in terms of the promotion, I would say that it's the same as with authors. Just do it if you're comfortable and don't do it if you're not comfortable because it doesn't suit everyone. And there's nothing worse than going to a festival or watching a panel event or hearing an interview where the person is clearly deeply uncomfortable and doesn't want to be there. Like if you're not that kind of person you're an introvert you don't like chatting about things that's fine like just don't promise anything that you can't do but certainly don't feel that you have to but having said that like it is lovely when you work with a translator who kind of is plugged into their own networks and can promote the book through them so like we worked with a brilliant translator called Sean Bai who's translates from Poland and he is um based in America and we published a a book that he translated for us in America as well as the UK and Australia and he was so kind of plugged into the translation community there and the people who were going to be interested in Polish writing and you know he had suggestions for events and he's like a good chatter so you can put him forward for anything and it does help like it does help we've worked with you know Danny Han he's great like he always puts himself forward for things he's always chatting about books like even just him talking on Twitter to his network helps. So if you've got those networks and you've got those opportunities and you want to do them, fantastic. Like just tell your publisher about them. You can collaborate. And if you don't, then don't force it because Mm. it's not like, it's just, it's kind of worse to do a bad event in a way than to do no event at all. That's really reassuring, Molly. Thanks so much. Um, I realised I'm not a model of a good German translator. I'm not very good at being punctual and timekeeping, and we've only got seven minutes left. So instead of having a break and then have a QA, and I'm just reminding people now that there's still time to put maybe one more question in the Q&A box. I will ask Bishan the same question. There won't be any more questions. So if you need time to reflect about your questions, you, there's, there's not going to be any new content apart from Bishan's reply, and we'll go straight to the Q&A after. I hope that's okay. Um, Bishan, how do you, what makes a good translator? Quick and snappy answer, obviously. <laughs> Easy question. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, I, 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 I thought about this because uh, I've been doing this for a while. And uh, as Molly correctly pointed out, that there are so many different thoughts, different schools literally about uh, what makes a good translation. Hmm. Uh, I have realized that ultimately, as an editor, as a publisher, I am allowed to be fairly subjective Mm -hmm. because I will choose what I like. And if there's something I don't like, I'm sure there are other publishers who would like them and uh, that work will find its uh, uh, way into the world. So uh, what I'm basically saying is, uh, to me, a good translation is something that, yes, captures the spirit of the original but at the same time must read as fluently as possible in the English language. That's, that's just like my belief. I, I know there are people who don't believe that, but it's because if I, and literally in the last uh, couple of months, I've been editing two or three books simultaneously where there's been such a big difference between the language, the English language 
some uh, and, and this has never been a problem generally has not been a problem from the German um, our uh, German translators are of are, are, are actually very very good and the and, and the texts they send in the manuscript they send us I I literally have to just look for like typos or something mostly mm. uh, but there are some other languages from which we also do pub, uh, translations published translations and some of them are just really really they, they literally have to be rewritten and I've been doing that and I find it frustrating especially when I don't have access to that original language. Again, I'm not talking about German here. Uh, having said that, uh, so yeah, so my, my, my goal is generally to make it read as easily as possible in English without Americanizing it, without Britishizing it, without Indianizing, Australianizing, whatever. I mean, uh, it needs still to be clear to the reader that this, you know, the, the setting is perhaps somewhere else. Uh, the characters are different. They behave somewhat differently culturally from, say, an American person, uh, uh, an, an average American person or average uh, Indian or German uh, or, or sorry, or, or British person. Uh, so I think it's a tight trope and there's no exact formula. It's very subjective. I think this will every editor will give you a different answer. And <laughs> I'm, I just gave you my basically. <laughs> And it's absolutely appreciated. What what I do like very much is in the answers is that you all appreciate that there are translations and that there is something different in publishing a translation. It brings something different to the English language um, publishing market as well. And that is why you publish translations. Um, we've got time for one question, I think, um, which is from Deborah Langton. Um, and it's referring to Seagull's plan for publication. So you see, based on what you've seen, Bishan, on having your list of German, 100 German books, um, Deborah's wondering whether to what extent Molly and Ina work in a spontaneous and reactive way when compiling any list of future publications, because isn't there, like, isn't there maybe a better business plan to actually have a list and like work towards that? What are your thoughts about that? Shall I go? Yeah. <laughs> go um, it's hard. Publishing is a weird business because <laughs> it's so incredibly subjective at every stage. You know, what agents choose to take on or publishers in other countries choose to take on is entirely on their own whims. And what we choose to take on is the same. And then what readers choose to pick up is the same. And so you sort of, you can't plan too much. Um, I think it would be quite hubristic to sort of claim that you knew what was going to sell well. Like if we knew, if we knew for certain, like these exact kinds of books are going to sell well, then we would publish them. Uh, but you don't. And that's kind of the joy of it as well. It's like finding interesting things and then making them work and, and finding that, that readership for them. I think, you know, you, as a publisher, you should have a broad plan. You should know roughly how many titles you're publishing. You should know if you're sticking with that number or, trying to grow it you should have an idea of the balance of genres on your list and like I'm always talking to my editorial team about particularly on the non-fiction side like oh we need more of this kind of book we need to balance this out we've done well with this kind of book in the past so let's try and bring one of those in so there are sort of genres that you'll be actively seeking and you you do approach authors directly sometimes more likely in the English language but you you do do that to fill gaps on your list um, but on the fiction side, it's really hard to say, like, right, next year I'm going to publish 10 novels and one of them is going to be German and one of them is going to be Swedish and one of them is going to be Nigerian or whatever. It just doesn't work like that because you, what you want to do is find the best books possible and that could come from so many different places. So I, I have a plan insofar as I know what the list balance should be. I know what kind of books we're good at publishing. I know the kinds of things that excite me. I know that I want books that, you know, have a good strong hook that give me plenty to talk to. Like I, I don't want to kind of have lovely quiet books that don't give you a lot to work with in the public. I've, I've been a publicist, so I know what a nightmare that is basically. <laughs> and I know that I want books that my entire team feels like they can get behind and you, you have certain agendas. Like I'm very keen to, it's not super relevant to this, but I'm very keen to broaden the languages that we translate from. So we've done a lot of German and Dutch in the past, for example, and um, quite a lot of European languages. So I'm quite interested in going outside of Europe. Um, 
But unless you have a specific project like Bishan's, I, I, for me, I think there's a danger in planning too much that you lose the kind of spontaneity that is how readers discover the best books. And I always think I, I like the analogy used earlier of going into a secondhand bookshop and there are many thousands of books there and you have no idea which one is going to be the one for you, but maybe you'll find it. And I do feel like as an editor, you go into your second bookshop and you there are many thousands of books available and you have a vague idea that you're interested in these kinds of writers who are doing these interesting things but then you stumble across something that is totally different from what you thought you were looking for and it's amazing and it's visionary and I would have never said oh I really want a thousand page Georgian German epic <laughs> to spend enormous amounts of money translating and printing but it turns out that's exactly what I did want so mm. I do think that um there's a danger in planning sort of too much and I I like the spontaneity and the reactiveness I think it's a, a nice part of being an editor Fair enough. and Aina very quick since we're over time but I guess you already you are doing that in a sense with Eloise Press right you are kind of curating a list yeah, well, Deborah, I, thank you for your question. But I was thinking actually, what do you mean by a plan? Because so if it's like, do I have the list for 23, 24, etc.? I do, but is the plan for you more like, okay, in 25, I'm going to do this language, this language, and this language. And here is, I agree with Molly. Um, I don't like doing this because I think you need to be open. Uh, you might find your best book tomorrow. Someone might pitch it to you. And I think you just need to go for it mm. if the budget allows. So again, I wouldn't plan massively ahead because things happen <laughs> and you find surprises. Um, so yeah, mix, probably 50-50 planning. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, and thanks to everybody um, for asking questions as well. I know, um, and I think to the editors as well, who've re been replying to questions in the, in the, um, the Q&A box while we were talking as well. So many more questions have been answered. Apologies for running slightly over time, but it's just so fascinating to talk to you. Um, huge thank you to Molly, Aina and Bishan for being with us, for being so generous with your time and your information as well with your sharing. Um, and thank you to the audience as well for being such active participants in this as well. I keep seeing the chat box popping up and so on as well. Um, just uh, the, this is part of the um, Advanced German Literary Translation Workshop and there's a couple more public events that I'd like to highlight. One is tonight, which is Translating the Holocaust with Peter Davies, um, which you can find information to on the BCLT website. And there's tomorrow, there's also an event on called Warts and All, How to Sustain a Career in Literary Translation, um, which is also relevant to this discussion, obviously, as well. Um, huge thank you again for attending, for listening so attentively and for being so generous. Um, Thanks so much. Have a good evening or day. Thanks.